He said, but if I get these two together, I'll cut a number one record. And he said, in fact, I'll cut a number one pop and country record. Who had a teenage daughter who attended Harper Valley Junior High. It wasn't just about Jeannie's sonorous voice, she was more. But most likely, you'd remember her initial fashion style before you remember her hit songs. Right, mini skirts and boots. However, what's more captivating is her journey from her childhood to stardom. Even though we do not hear her songs everywhere like before, she has left an indelible mark in the music industry. And in this video, we will discuss the life and career of Jeannie C. Riley. Get ready to know more about this music icon. Let's go. A family business. Unlike many artists that you know who tell tales of how they started singing from the uterus, Jeannie's story is different. When Jeannie C. Riley was born, Jean Carolyn Stevenson on October 19, 1945, of course, no one expected her to become a musician. Even her whining as a neonate never sounded so pleasant to give anyone a clue. And to seal it off, she was born and raised in Jones County, north of Abilene, where ranching and dryland cotton farming were big business. Yeah, her small, tiny eyes were first open to farming, and oh, she enjoyed every bit of it. As she matured in the 50s, she was fully immersed in the family business of cotton picking. Her father, Oscar Stevenson, was a sharecropper, so the whole family, including Jeannie, her mother Nora, and her older sister Helen, chopped and picked cotton. They worked so hard, but even with all that they did, they didn't make a lot as you might have imagined. But were they happy? Yes, they were content and united in love. But if there was anything else that bound the family, it was music and faith. He was a mechanic, she was a nurse at the time that I recorded Harper Valley PTA. Surrounded by music and faith. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, they say. Jeannie came from a family that loves music and holds its faith seriously. As for the latter, nobody in that family was as faithful as Jeannie's maternal grandfather, Reverend William R. Moore who was a Nazarene street preacher. And Jeannie's mother? She longed to follow in the footsteps of her musical idol, Molly O'Day. Together, father and daughter evangelized on street corners in Anson and across West Texas. That was what Jeannie grew up to absorb daily. Reverend William didn't make any excuse or spare any street of Texas. He preached loudly and everywhere to the point he was arrested and jailed for disturbing the patrons of an Amarillo bar with his preaching. If you thought that would have brought the old man down, you still do not understand who Reverend William was. According to Jeannie, Grandpa's proudest moment was his jail time which he likened to the jail time of Apostle Paul. The old man was never silent. Every night, the sound of his harmonica was what carried Jeannie to dreamland. Jeannie's father was not left out. He also had this French harp that he played every time, one of the memories Jeannie can never forget. Well, the note said, Mrs. Johnson, you're wearing your dress is way too high. A secret passion. You can tell that Jeannie's family is a happy one, even though they didn't have much. But things soon changed for the better when her father quit farming, became a mechanic, and moved to town. Her mother also completed nursing school and worked at the Anson General Hospital. Then, the girls stopped picking cotton and spent their time listening to music. Helen, a serious student and clarinet player, opted for Mozart and Beethoven, while Jeannie preferred Little Richard, Lefty Frizzle, and the blues. But one thing nobody knew was that Jeannie had a passion for music. She kept it all to herself and only sang into her hairbrush with the female country greats, especially Patti Page and later Connie Smith. According to her, Patti Page made her believe in the power of music. But no matter how much she thought about music, she kept her passion a secret. She never sang to the radio, never joined the choir, and didn't sing anywhere. If anyone knew about her ability, it was only her hairbrush. And Mrs. Taylor sure seems to use a lot of eyes whenever he's away. The shocking revelation. It was, however, not too long before Jeannie's need to sing got the best of her in 1961. It all started when her uncle, Johnny Moore, had scored a modest hit in Nashville with the song 15 Acres of Peanut Land and was running a monthly showcase. Jones County Jamboree at the Anson High School Auditorium. Jeannie knew that if she wanted to be a singer, she had to bite the bullet. However, what she didn't want was to sing in her hometown. But if she didn't sing there, where else would she go? One night, an hour before the Jamboree started, Jeannie asked Moore if she might perform. Her uncle was shocked as he had never heard her sing, but he swallowed it and decided to give his niece a chance. He told her to work something up with the band and chose Ray Price's My Shoes Keep Walking Back to You and Gene Shepard's If You Were Losing Him to Me What Would You Do for her public debut. Crazy enough, her father, who didn't know she was on the bill, was in the audience but her mother was at work. 
The moment Jeannie's name was mentioned, her father was more than shocked. But good for Jeannie, the look on her father's face didn't make her forget the lyrics. The only mistake she made according to her was wearing slacks and a sweater set instead of a dress because people could see her knees slapping together. But who cares? It was two performances that attracted two rounds of supportive applause, and just like that, she was hooked. From that night, Jeannie became a regular on the Jamboree in both Anson and eventually nearby Truby. This breakthrough only opened Jeannie's eyes to see a bigger picture. She started dreaming about going to Nashville to sing every time she looked out the window. What exactly did Nashville have to offer? Anson to Nashville. Just as Jeannie dreamed, the opportunity to move to Nashville came. But it didn't come that easily. At this time, in 1963, at age 18, Jeannie got married to Mickey Riley, an Anson native. Mickey knew about his wife's dream, but there was little to nothing that he could do. But in the summer of 1966, Moore organized and funded a family trip to Nashville for Jeannie that included Mickey and their baby Kim, her parents, and several other family members. It was one of Jeannie's dreams to come true. They all drove to Nashville and spent three days, and during the stay, on a backstage tour of the Opry, the family encountered Doyle Wilburn, a grand old Opry performer who had branched into music publishing and television. After a brief conversation, Wilburn agreed to let Jeannie cut a demo, and guess what? It was magical. Her voice got Wilburn's attention, but her years of emulating her idol interfered. You see, Jeannie sounded too much like Connie Smith, and when things like these happen, it becomes difficult for the world to accept another version of a favorite they already have. So what did Jeannie do? She learned to be herself, and nobody else. But sadly, they were not in Nashville to stay forever. After the three-day stay, the family returned to Anson, where Jeannie continued to sing at the Jamboree and cry into her dishwater as she listened to country music. She always dreamed of a life like that of Loretta Lynn and her all-time favorite Merle Haggard, but couldn't do anything to achieve it. Mickey sensed that Jeannie would never be happy without taking an extended shot at Nashville stardom, and so he made a decision for her. He told Jeannie one day to pack their stuff as they would be leaving Anson for Nashville. Soon, the family moved, but things were not very easy out there. In the early fall of 1966, things changed when Uncle Johnny Moore again came to the rescue. He bought a gas station in downtown Nashville that Mickey managed. And there, it all began to make sense. Mickey played Jeannie's demo tape at the station, and it caught the ear of Nashville businessman and music industry insider Jerry Chestnut, who played it for Monument Records. Monument Records arranged for Jeannie to attend a DJ convention in Nashville, where she was going to be promoted as the label's next big thing. But the label had a female star at the time, who heard of the plan and put her foot down that no one was going to take her place. For that, the label withdrew the contract. But did Jeannie give up? That was never in her plan. Road to Stardom To many people, they thought Jeannie just sang a song that Tom Hall wrote, No, there's a story that you didn't know. You see, after Jerry Chestnut was impressed by Jeannie's demo, he hired her to be his receptionist at his publishing company, Paskey Music. But she never stopped recording memos. She recorded a demo of Old Town Drunk, a song with a hard-edged, sarcastic tone, for her songwriter friend Royce Clark. A song that producer Shelby Singleton heard soon after he'd heard Harper Valley PTA, written by then-unknown Tom Hall. He was impressed and called Jeannie in for a meeting. There he vowed that they could make something magical with Jeannie's talent, but even Jeannie never believed those words. Singleton promised to deliver a pop hit, but Jeannie wanted to sing traditional country. She hated the song, which was originally arranged in the ballad style of Ode to Billy Joe, leaving it lifeless. Then, Singleton demanded a three-year contract with troublesome provisions. What put Jeannie totally off was the fact that Singleton wanted to change her name to Rhonda Renee because there were just too many Jeannies in Nashville. Jeannie hated the idea of performing with somebody else's name because how would the folks at home ever know it was her under another name? When she wouldn't cooperate with Singleton, he then promised the B-side of the record to Clark and his wife Jerry, who were Jeannie's best friends in addition to being songwriters. As authors of the B-side single, the couple would receive the same royalties as Hall for every copy sold. The Clarks applied emotional pressure, and Jeannie eventually gave in. Singleton booked a studio at Columbia for the last Friday night in July 1968, and it saw an angry Jeannie walk over from her Music Row office. She was very angry because she hated everything about the whole deal. She didn't even take her time to look at the song until she got to the studio. By the time Jeannie was asked to sing, she let out her anger with full force. While the recording was going on, Singleton's wife suggested changing the last line of the song from The Day My Mama Broke Up the Harper Valley PTA to 
the day my mama socked it to the Harper Valley PTA, a suggestion that later proved to be historic. By the time Jeannie finished the second take after only 15 minutes, everyone knew they'd created something that was going to roar onto the scene. Musicians began calling friends to come listen. In the excitement, Singleton conceded to the name Jeannie C. Riley, and the production began. The team created acetates, copies that could be played at the radio stations, for distribution the next day. According to Jeannie, her anger made the song better, as she had to sing it madly and recklessly to sound the way it did. Who had a teenage daughter who attended Harper Valley Junior High? The Story and Success of Harper Valley PTA the record quickly became one of the best-known country music songs of all time. Jeannie became the first woman to hold the number one spot on the pop and country charts with the same song. By the next weekend, Jeannie was on television. Soon, she began headlining shows, some of which attracted 80,000 people on the power of one song. Experienced stars such as Charlie Pride, Waylon Jennings, Farron Young, and Merle Haggard found themselves opening for the newcomer. She even had the privilege to sing for President Nixon. The song was requested so often that a DJ at Lubbock's KLLL locked himself in his booth and played Harper Valley for 36 hours straight, so people would quit asking to hear it. As mentioned earlier, Harper Valley PTA immediately became a hit and topped the Billboard Hot 100 and Hot Country Songs charts, a feat not repeated by a female artist until Dolly Parton's 1981 hit, 9 to 5. But even with this song's fame, only a few know the story behind the song. The song is about Mrs. Johnson, a widowed woman who confronts members of the PTA after her daughter brings home a note from school critical of her mother's penchant for miniskirts and dating various men. Mrs. Johnson turns the tables on the PTA and exposes its hypocrisy one member at a time, noting that their private behavior is far worse than hers. Now you know why Jeannie's miniskirts were necessary and important to the song. She turned the whole country upside down and became an overnight sensation, as the single earned her the Grammy Award for Best Female Country Vocal Performance and was named the Country Music Association Single of the Year. Jeannie also became one of the few country artists ever nominated in the major pop Grammy Award categories of Best New Artist and Record of the Year. The single sold over 5.5 million copies worldwide and was awarded a gold disc by the RIAA just four weeks after its release. The album of the same name sold over 1 million units to earn Jeannie another gold record. The song's success helped Jeannie make country music history in 1969 as the first female vocalist to have her own major network variety special, Harper Valley USA, which she hosted with Jerry Reed. The show featured performances by Mel Tillis and the song's writer Tom T. Hall. This song didn't stop in the music scene, but extended to the movie industry. The song spawned a 1978 film and a 1981 to 1982 television series, both titled Harper Valley PTA and starring Barbara Eden as the widow Mrs. Johnson. Jeannie's Influence and Challenges Since Harper Valley PTA's release, Jeannie has ranked among the most popular female vocalists in the country music industry. She had five Grammy Award nominations and four Country Music Association nominations and performed a duet with one of her idols, Loretta Lynn. But what happened to the songs after her hit? She sure had success on the country charts again, but they were nothing like her first hit. Other hits following Harper Valley PTA include The Girl Most Likely, There Never Was a Time, The Rib, The Backside of Dallas, Country Girl, Oh Singer, and Good Enough to Be Your Wife. But with all the game, Jeannie faced challenges in her career. She became known as much for her sex appeal and beauty as for her music, foreshadowing Shania Twain and other contemporary female vocalists by nearly three decades. At a time when many country queens were keeping a wholesome image by wearing gingham dresses, Jeannie kept in tune with typical late 1960s fashion by donning miniskirts and go-go boots for her stage outfits, just like Mrs. Johnson in PTA. Her mod persona opened doors and perhaps started a revolution in country music as hemlines of other female country artists' stage outfits began rising in the years that followed. The fact that her management and her public demanded she appear in miniskirts instead of the long, elegant gowns that were industry standard widened the chasm. Decades later, she is haunted by the memory of commissioning a long, multi-tiered gown for the Country Music Awards, where she and Harper Valley earned nominations. When Jeannie arrived pre-show to pick it up, she discovered Singleton had redesigned it as a mini dress complete with silver go-go boots. As she prepared to perform Harper Valley at the awards show in the tiny dress, 
Jeannie heard one of the reigning queens of the country exclaim, Well, shit! as the diva took in the outfit. For that, she silently prayed that her song wouldn't win the award, and she hoped never to set foot back on the stage. It was a difficult battle that she fought alone. When Jeannie released When Love Has Gone Away, a song she considers one of her best, a DJ's review read, This is one of Jeannie C. Riley's best performances, but nobody wants to hear her sing like this. Give us that sass and we'll play her records. The negativity took its toll. Those words stole her confidence and made her wonder if she was a viable artist. From secular to gospel. As you must have expected, Jeannie's success brought her several offers from Hollywood. She appeared with Bing Crosby, Dean Martin, Bette Davis, Tom Jones, Ed Sullivan, and others on various television programs. However, in 1972, she said goodbye to Plantation Records for MGM Records, recording several albums. Out of all, only two of her singles from the period, Good Morning Country Rain and Give Myself a Party, cracked the top 30. Although later stints at Mercury Records and Warner Brothers Records produced only a couple of charted singles, she remained in demand as a concert artist well into the 1980s. However, as Jeannie made people happy, she battled bipolar disorder that left her bedridden with debilitating depression for months at a time. She lost her faith, but found it again on her knees in the Mount Hope Cemetery near Anson, where according to her, she and God had a heartfelt conversation that sent her back to the scriptures. In the mid-70s, Jeannie became a born-again Christian and began recording gospel music. It was a switch nobody expected. As a result of her conversion, she distanced herself from PTA for a time due to its content. However, the song remained part of her live set that she continued to perform in her shows. In 1980, she became more intentional about her conversion and published her autobiography, From Harper Valley to the Mountaintop, which told the story of pop music stardom and later moved to gospel music. After that, the next album she released was a gospel album with the same title in 1981, Personal Life. Beyond Jeannie Riley's hook on stardom was an unstable marital life. She and Mickey Riley divorced in 1970 at the height of her career. However, after she converted, they remarried in 1975 and settled in Franklin, Tennessee. After the release of her autobiography, From Harper Valley to the Mountaintop, and a gospel album of the same name, and she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. The Rileys divorced again in 1991. Two years later, Mickey moved back in to help Jeannie battle depression, an arrangement that continued until he remarried three years later. Jeannie remained without a husband until 2012, when she married her childhood friend, Billy Starnes, in 2012. Jeannie was involved in an accident that saw her fall back in 2002, a fall that prevented her from performing for a long time. For the accident, she sued Big Lot's parent company, Consolidated Stores Corporation, for $250,000 in 2003. While Jeannie is happier than ever, living the peaceful life that she desired and aging gracefully, she recently had a thyroid surgery that got fans all over the world concerned. Jeannie C. Riley, now 78 years old, must be very fulfilled looking back at her life and the impact she left in the entertainment industry. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. And Mrs. Taylor sure seems to use a lot of ice whenever he's away.